I don't believe it. Today of all days. What am I going to do? The other day it wouldn't have mattered. I've got to think quickly. Lost to the station, might just get there in time by train. But what about tomorrow? It's got to be in Birmingham by now, and I need the car for that. I know. Get it to the garage first. But how do I get it started now? Excuse me. Any chance of a push start? Sir? Yes, please. I've got a problem with the car. The damn thing won't start on me, and I'm in a hurry. Now, can you fix it? Now, it'll need to be finished by tonight. Uh, I've got a, a very important meeting tomorrow. Here are the keys. Um, it's just parked outside the door, and uh, I'll give you a call later. I've got to run, or I'll miss my train. Your name, sir? We'll at least need to have your name. Yes, sorry. It's Johnson. Mr. Johnson. Hmm. Now, let's have a look. It's all over 800 and it won't start. It's got to be the battery then, hasn't it? Shouldn't take long to swap it for a new one. Just whip the terminals off and throw it straight in the bin. That's it. A job well done. Get a new one from the stores. When I've had a coffee. Hello, yes, sir. Uh... It looks as though I'll have to travel to Birmingham this afternoon. Do you think the car will be ready by two o'clock? You don't think there'll be any problem? Good. How's it getting on? It's changing the battery. You, you sure it's the battery? It's only just out of warranty and uh, everything else is working. All right, if you say so. How long then? Back in half an hour. All right. Right then. Let's just try it. Funny. Could have sworn it was the battery. So, if it's not the battery, what can it be? I know. A starter solenoid. Yeah. I had one go in my own car not so long ago. It's bound to be that. Better get his battery out of the bin, I suppose. Starter what? Starter solenoid? I thought you said it was the battery. Okay, but just remember, I have to be in Birmingham this afternoon. Ring back when? An hour, all right. not a solenoid. What else could be wrong? Uh, no, Mr. Johnson. No, I, I'm afraid it wasn't the starter relay, but we're sure we've tracked it down to a faulty ignition switch. Yes, I, I do understand your problem, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, oh yes, I'm sure the car will be ready shortly. Can you ring me back a little later on? No, I can't. Look, this meeting is just about finished. I'll be around to sort this mess out myself. Look, 
can you do something to sort him out? I mean, my phone's steaming. Mr. Johnson's not a happy man. Oh, how are you getting on, Ken? Okay, let's try and take stock of the situation before we lose this customer altogether. Where's your fault finding manual? No, not that. There's a special electrics manual for these with a wiring diagram for every circuit on the car. Hang on, let's get this right. Are you telling me that you've changed all these components, wasted an entire morning, and all the time you've been working blind? Yeah, but it wouldn't look that really. I mean, I thought it had to be the battery. It usually is, yeah, isn't and it? And you thought it was the solenoid, and you thought it was the relay. Look, I don't want to argue, Ken. Look, just forget everything you've done so far and start again from scratch. But this time, for Christ's sake, use this. This is good. Fuse functions, harness layouts, everything. Now, start the circuit. Where's that? Great. Right. I know the battery's in good condition. I've changed that. Engine earth strap. Why didn't I think of that one? I hope it's nothing as simple as that. Thank God. It looks okay. Now. What else? So, a fusible link in the engine bay fuse box. Just pop the lid. They're all okay. Right. The starter rail is fed through a fuse in the under dash fuse box. What's the problem? Well, there have been one or two hitches. One or two hitches. We're guessing that. You told me by two o'clock. Yeah, I've just you been promised me the rest. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson, Johnson. I just spoke to him. Doesn't sound very happy, a, does he? Is this the man I've got to thank for? Well, who can blame him? But what about our mechanic, Ken? Should we also feel sorry for him? Perhaps not. But all of us, at one time or another, have tried the same sort of approach. Whether it's sitting out on a journey without planning a proper route, or trying to assemble a kitchen cabinet without reading the instructions. Human nature can sometimes lead us to dive in at the deep end without a passing thought for the likely consequences. And so often, those consequences can be confusion and distress. And alongside this urge to dive in is a fear of the unknown. For so many of us, electrics is a black art. We feel that there's little alternative but to dive in, blindly fumbling about, changing components, pulling on wires, in the vague hope somehow the fault will jump out and make itself known to us. So what can you do? If, like me, you're an electrics novice, and you're faced with a problem like Ken's non-starter. Well, the key lies within these. And we saw Ken use one briefly in his Comedy of Errors. The electrical fault-finding manual has been designed specifically to make the job of finding faults on circuits, even quite complex ones, 
altogether less of a shot in the dark. Now these have been produced in the new Metro range, for over 200 and 400 series, and for the 1991 model year Rover 800. Right, that's enough theory. Let's see now how the information used in these manuals can be used to identify a real fault. We're going to use the Rover 800 starter circuit again, but this time it's an altogether different fault. Well, just to add a touch of realism, we haven't told Pete here exactly where the fault is. Now, on this occasion, the receptionist managed to grab hold of the customer for more than a few seconds and gained a reasonable description of the fault. He said that the trouble started some weeks ago, but that the engine would turn over eventually. But then it gradually got worse until the starter ceased to operate altogether. As to symptoms, he's described a sort of clicking sound under the bonnet when the keys turned. Okay, so Pete, where do we start? Well, as you say, we've got a pretty good description of the fault from the customer, but uh, we shouldn't jump in there just yet. You see, the way a customer describes a fault isn't necessarily the way that you would describe a fault. So, we check it out. If you could just turn it over for me, please. Right here. Well, he's right there. There's nothing happening. Um, could you just try the headlamps for me, please? Uh-huh. Yeah, nice and bright. So, it doesn't look like a battery problem, but we still can't be sure at this point. You see, what I'm doing is collecting all the information about the fault by looking at the symptoms it produces. I'm not making any assumptions or pulling anything apart. I'm keeping an open mind. And this is the first step to a three-point guide to diagnosis. Right. So step one, collect all the info. Right. Now, before we move on to stage two, there are one or two more important basic checks that we need to carry out. So what exactly are these basic checks? I mean, should we be using the same basic checks before diagnosing any fault? Well, basically, yes. You see, one of the first things you're taught in the motor trade is to check the basics first. Uh, you must have heard the phrase, check fuel and sparks. Well, in, in electrics diagnosis, the same back to basics rules apply. Um, it's just a straightforward, but the thing to remember here is check battery condition and earth. In this case, uh, checking the condition of the battery shouldn't be too difficult because we can be reasonably sure that the battery's charge isn't the cause of our problem. You see, the headlamp test we did told us that. Now, using this digital multimeter, set on DC volts, I can do a rough check on the charge of the battery by measuring the amount of voltage it's putting out. Now, normally, the next thing to do would be to turn the headlamps on for 30 seconds to remove any surface charge. But as we've had the headlights on earlier, that's no problem. OK, next thing, put the probes across the terminals, red to red. Let me then take our reading. That's 12.4, so that's fine. Uh, anything less than 12.3 would have led, led me to suspect the battery. Right, next step, the main earth connections. Now remember our golden rule. That's check battery condition and earth. Now by m main earth connections, what I mean is those between the battery, the body, and the engine. Uh-huh. Now don't just get hold of the wires and give them a good pull to make sure that they're, they're, they're nice and tight. We've got to make sure that there isn't any build-up of corrosion or any paintwork beneath the connection, OK? Right. So that involves taking it right off. Right. That seems fine. Connection's nice and clean, no corrosion. Now, a good tip before putting anything back, especially the bolts, is to smother everything in petroleum jelly. That'll prevent any future build-up of corrosion. Right. Now we'll just pop the battery back in. And this will complete the first stage of our three-step guide to diagnosis.
Right. Now on to st stage two. Right, so back to our guide. Right. Now using the information we've collected about the symptoms, we use the fault finding guide and diagrams to isolate the general area of the fault. Okay, so stage two, analyze info to determine general area. Right. Now, using our Bible, the electrical fault finding manual, we flip through to starting. Instruments. Starting. Right, now this is the general starting diagram, but what we need to look at is the fault finding guide. Now it comes under two headings, that starter solenoid clicks but starter fails to operate, and starter motor and solenoid fail to operate. Now as I said earlier, on this particular car, with the clicking we heard, it told us to believe that it was actually the starter relay and not the louder clunk of the solenoid. But now I need to be sure. So if you can give me a hand for a minute and just turn the engine over please. Okay, hang on. Okay, flip the switch. Right, just as I thought. The relay's clicking, but the solenoid's absolutely dead. Now the clicking on this relay tells us that it's switching circuits working. Now this is about as far as we can go with step two. So remember, step two is about using the information we've collected to highlight the general area of the fault. Yes, analyze info to determine the general area. Right. Now the information tells us that the fault doesn't lie in the switching circuit of the relay. Now on the face of it, that doesn't seem like we've got very far. But in actual fact, we've isolated over half the circuit by using simple logic. The fusible links, all the fuses, the ignition switch, and all the wiring along this line. Okay then. So what's step three? Right, step three is a practical series of tests that I have to carry out in, in a logical sequence to pinpoint the fault. Okay then. So step three is carry out tests to pinpoint fault. Right. Up until now, apart from those few basic checks to the battery and earth points, it's all been pure theory. Now it's time to get my hands dirty. So where's the most logical place for our first test? Well, first, we've got to have a clear idea of what we want to achieve. Now we've eliminated this part of the circuit, the relay switching circuit, and now we've got to check along here, the feed to the solenoid. Right, now there's a fusible link. Now when you go to the power distribution section, ah, in actual fact there are two fusible links. Now they're nice and easy to find, they're all under here. Now they all seem fine. Now an important thing to remember is that a blown fuse is usually the symptom of a fault and rarely a fault in itself. Nine times out of ten, the fuse blows because of a fault somewhere else in the circuit. Everything's fine there, so what should we do next? Well, now that's put me on the spot. Um, we know the fuses are okay, and the next thing in the circuit is the relay. But we've tested that, haven't we? Not really, no. Now the clicking tells us that it's getting the right signal from the ignition switch, but we don't know that it's actually switching the power to the solenoid. Ah, oh, point taken. Well, what's the quickest way of testing the relay then? Well, this fast check is available for testing just about any kind of relay or timer unit found on rover cars. Now, first of all, we should check the harness. But we've already done that, so that's no problem. Right. Pop that in there. Now, we look for the type of relay and the test code in this booklet. Okay. There we are, this is the relay, and it's test code two. So, power on. Set the test code, that's number two. Set, and test. There, you can hear the relay clicking away. There we are, this relay's passed the test. So we're gonna have to look a bit deeper for the cause of our fault. Now, what do you think we should test next? And think about it logically. Okay, well we've tested the relay, we know it's switching circuits working. So, well shouldn't we next look at what the relay controls? The starter solenoid. Very good. Let's hope for you, yet. Yeah. Right, we'll go back to starting. 
From the relay, a feed runs along this brown and red wire to the solenoid. But before we jump onto the solenoid, I want to check this relay block just to make sure that there's a battery feed available. Now, a very important thing to remember is that you should never probe directly into the front face of these connectors. Why not? Well, if you press the probe into the female connector, you'll open it up. Now, the last thing we want in a circuit is a sloppy fit. However, there is a way around this, and that is to probe into the back of the connector and touch the probe onto the cable crimp. As you can see, with this relay, we're going to have a problem. And we can't get into the back of the connectors without pulling the fuse box apart. However, there is a way around it. By using one of these, the spare Lucar connector, we can actually probe onto that. Now this terminal here should have a battery feed. There we are, battery voltage. So, we pop the relay back in, and I'd like you to turn the ignition key again for me if you could. Yes, but wait a minute, what are you going to do now? Right. Now we know that there's feed to the relay, and we know that the relay's working. So now we've got to check whether there's actual feed getting to the solenoid. Now if there is, we've got a dodgy solenoid. If there isn't, we know that the fault lies between the relay and the solenoid. Right, are you ready? Yep. Come on then. Okay, there's nothing. So now we've narrowed down the fault in the wiring between the relay and the solenoid. Right, so I think I've got it. All we need to do then is run a new wire from the solenoid up the relay, right? No, now that's, the, that's the one thing you shouldn't do. Firstly, altering any vehicle's wiring will make it more difficult to work on in the future. But more importantly, you could be held personally responsible for any problems arising from your trip wiring job. Need I say more? No, I have a picture. All right then, so well, how do I find the fault? I mean, it's easy to say that the fault lies somewhere between here and here, but the wiring disappears inside the engine harness. Yes, that's right. But there's one important factor on our side. Now, statistically, the fault is more likely to be in a connection than in a straight wiring run. In fact, around 90% of all electrical faults can be tied down to a connection of one kind or another. Now, if you can't physically trace the wire from point to point, then just look for any connections along it. Ah, I can do that. I go back to the fault-finding manual. Very good. Right, so we're looking for what? brown and red wire. Now, there's a connection on the solenoid, but we know that that's all right. And um, there are two more. One on the starter relay. That goes inside the fuse box. And another with the code C255. Right, I don't really want to take the fuse box apart unless I really have to. So we'll try and have a look for the connection C255. Right. Here we are. Two pin. C255. Photo 15. So, flick through to the photo reference. 11. 15. Here we are. C255. Well, according to this, it's just behind here. So we'll whip the battery off. Right. Hopefully, we'll find it behind here. We won't have to mess around with the fuse box. Right. Brown and red cable, pulled right out of the back. Probably snagged on the battery at some time or other. Shouldn't be too much trouble to fix that. Well, there we have it. Fault diagnosis as it should be done. Okay. So I don't consider that I've reached Pete's level of expertise just yet. But even I can see how much easier fault diagnosis becomes when you use the correct approach. Right. Before we round off, let's just take a look at the most important points again. First, the correct approach to fault diagnosis. Three simple steps to follow on every fault-finding job. Make sure you're in possession of all the facts. 
look closely at the customer's complaint, but don't take it as gospel. Try it out yourself. Armed with this information, study the wiring diagram and the fault diagnosis trail to isolate the general area of the fault. Then, and only then, work through the circuit in a logical manner to pinpoint the fault. Ken showed us the pitfalls of diagnosis by substitution. At best, it's hit and miss. Substitution also involves much making and breaking of connection. And if you're not careful, you'll end up with more faults than you started with. Now, Pete has given us two basic checks to carry out. Just as you're taught to look for fuel and sparks on any mechanical problem, so also you must learn how to check battery condition and earth points before attempting to solve any electrical problem. Finally, this booklet has been designed to complement the program, and it's full of information for those of you just breaking into electrical diagnosis, together with hints and tips for the more experienced among you. Okay then, let's see how Pete's getting on. Finished yet? Not quite. I'm just putting some petroleum jelly on these battery terminals, and then we'll be fine. Okay. You could do the honours for me, please. Okay, hang on. Bingo. One Rover 800 starter circuit, well and truly fixed.